welcome to the Enterprise Sessions. Today, I'm talking to Dr. Harry Destiqua. Harry's been a PhD student, turned academic, turned founder, and now turned venture capitalist. Harry, welcome. I'm really grateful that you found the time to talk to me. Well, thank you very much for having me, Michelle. So where I like to start is, I mean, you're pretty well known. A lot of people will have an idea of, of who you are and what you do now, but let's rewind. What brought you to Bristol? What was your background before, before your time at the university? I had done, I did my undergraduate at Plymouth University in applied chemistry. And then um, I couldn't really get a job. Um, I think it's a running theme in my life, actually. Um, and I ended, I ended up, ended up um, after, I, I didn't have a kind of a year out before university. So I thought I'd do a, a year out. And I kind of um, decided I wanted to learn to snowboard. So I ended, ended up doing a, a ski season in, in, in Morzine and... Um, and then after that, I worked in restaurants a lot and I thought maybe I should try and get a job. So I decided to go to Canada. I thought maybe I'll be able to get a job there. I went to Canada for, for the Winter Olympics, hoping to get a job in chemistry. Couldn't get a job in chemistry, so I ended up being a cleaner at the Olympic Stadium and doing all sorts. And then I said to myself, it's been two years since you've had you got your degree. You, you know, you probably need to maybe go back and, 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 and um, um, continue. So I decided um, to apply to Bristol um, to a master's of research program. I always loved the kind of practical nature of, 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 of lab work and of research um, and got accepted into Professor Tony Davis's group um, and yeah, flew back from, from Canada, um, came to Bristol, had kind of a week before I started, found some accommodation and um, yeah, started in, in Tony's, Tony's research group. Um, so that's, that's how, I, how I came to Bristol. Um, really because of a string of failures, not being able to get jobs. A divine failure. For the benefit of people listening to this that have that don't know the Xylo story, why don't you sum up that story for us? There was there was three co-founders um, on the initial company. So it was um, myself, uh, Tom, who was my flatmate and who had gone to, to you know, had, had known from back home and met in Bristol. He was an actuary. Um, and he was, you know, very good with, um, you know, uh, writing and maths. And I'm actually severely dyslexic, so I really need a lot, a big yeah. support network around me in order for everything to have happened. Um, and then uh, Tony, obviously, you know, it's his research. I was sort of just there at the right time. Um, and then, you know, we set the company up in 2014. And then we we met um, Keith, who was, ended up being our chair, who, who you knew now. He's also the chairman of the incubators as well now. Um, and Keith provided a very in, a initial investment. I remember me and Tom kind of being given a five thousand pound check from Keith that he posted from Ireland, and um, you know taking that check to Barclays. And I'd never seen a check with five thousand pounds written on it. So it was like we were really like there was a crazy amount of money at that that point. Um, so it started. It started. It started with a five thousand pound check from 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 Keith, um, and then we ended up um, getting onto the iQR program. Um, we ended up, you know, licensing the technology from the university. Um, that program, we ended up being awarded half a million pound grant from that program, which was enormous. Um, we then raised a small. We had raised a small angel round of a, a couple of hundred k. Um, and then one of the things that we did along the story, which is where things get a bit meta, is um, in 2015, a year after founding Xylo, founded the second company, um, which was one of the problems we had when we spun the company out was where do we put it? Mm. Um, where's our where's you know where's home? And at the time, there was no space in in Bristol. Um, I mean, you you faced this as well, mm. um, and we decided. To set up a second company and build a Bristol deep tech biotech incubator in the city centre, and that ended up being the first of the science creates incubators. So we built our own. We ended up building our own incubator for our own startup. Because one startup um, wasn't enough. You know, you needed more excitement in your life. But... Yeah, and you, and you can see there's. <laughs> but like... there was a need. It was really, really clear at that time. There was you. There was me. There was a bunch of other people who were all banging their heads against the same brick walls, trying to sublet a space in you know, industrial parks, there was no community or there was a community, but it was all hidden and dispersed. 
Yeah. So you founded what was then Unit DX, right? What was Unit DX, and then it ended up that ended up being Science Creates, kind of first incubator. So we and then so I was running Xylo, and we Xylo was um, so we had this glucose sensing technology, and we thought we could make sensors initially, and um, continuous sensors for to, to monitor um, blood sugar, um, and then we ended up pivoting towards um, smart insulins. We opened the first incubator in 2017, which was a crazy project. And I attribute kind of running the incubator and building the incubator with, with you know, working with architects and planners was a massive part of the learning of my entrepreneurial journey because I learned to like project manage. I learned how to deliver complexity was like not to do everything yourself, to try and understand it. But then, you, you know, you need electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, architects, builders, you know, all these different people in order to deliver a whole building. Um, so we moved Xylo in to the first incubator and then um, we actually ended up um, licensing in some, a second load of IP from the University of Bristol um, around a similar time. And actually there was a big breakthrough um, that happened in Tony's group. So we, we, we ended up employing kind of the PhD um, student and then um, graduate um, um, from, from from the group to Thomas Tromans to um, into the company with this new second of IP. And then um, a year later, we were acquired by Nova Nordisk. So it was a really crazy story. Um, there was 10 of us. We'd raised less than a million of equity in, in four years. We'd kind of built Xylo, built an incubator. And then we ended up being acquired by um, Nova Nordisk in, yeah, in 2018, which was completely unexpected and not not really part of the plan mm -hmm. just just before you move on you're acquired for can you remind us how much up to 800 million dollars yeah. um but it was it was it's a staged acquisition so uh, so i think that, I that, that often I often gets get that often out there. often often gets misquoted um but it's nevertheless a really vast sum you, we need to was... we need to acknowledge that that i remember that week vividly it was the august as i recall yeah. because every corridor i walked down whether it was at my spin out or in the university people would sidle up to me and say when are you going to do that yeah. <laughs> i must have been asked that at least a dozen times in the first two okay. days you obviously place huge importance on on the team on the people all working together and i think i'm right in saying that you've actually built several teams in the various steps of the career that you've highlighted. So what's your approach to, to formulating a team that can really deliver on, on some of these big challenges? Just hire people that are smarter than you and get out <laughs> their way. Um, I think, you know, it's, a, it's a, the general thing. Like I think often you see within companies, you know, um, that person who's like really performing kind of like they almost get held back because their boss, do you know what I mean? Like doesn't want to be embarrassed. Um, is that kind of, what is that saying where you kind of, people get kind of like promoted to the point of their incompetence. Yeah. incompetence. So, you know, trying to kind of, when you spot that talent, like nurture it and mentor it and encourage it. And I think like a lot of the job is just, just, just really to try and get the best out of people. Um, and um, that's what I've done. I've also learned that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm um, messy, um, disorganized, and you know I need people who are organized and structured mm -hmm. and um, around me in order for that to work. So I think it's about whatever kind of flavor you are, kind of in terms of your own like neurodiversity or your own psychology. It's about having balance within teams and trying to kind of get kind of that blend of extroverts and introverts and people who think like narrowly and, and are really structured and people who are like all over the place and connecting all the dots like you know we need to try and bring all of that into teams so you've got kind of people feel like they're kind of responsible so you, I see I kind of like thinking about having kind of the people in the different quadrants mm. um, together in a teams and that gives you kind of a real edge in a startup in terms of being able to kind of see things from different angles I mean I think that gives you an edge in whatever industry startups academia beyond but I do think it's a recruitment challenge because you talk about finding really smart people and not holding them back. But then if also, if we're thinking about extroverts and introverts and, and different ways of living and being, it's much easier. But some people make that much more visible than others. Some people you have to work harder or know them better to see that brilliance. And if you're going for a half hour interview, you're not going to get to the same point with everybody. So do you have a method you use to make sure you clearly value inclusivity in your teams 
how do you achieve that? Um, there's, you know, so a lot of, there's a lot of people within the team that take the recruitment process very, very seriously. So I think um, it's about getting the team buy-in and, and getting everybody in. So we, we have kind of blinded recruitment processes where we kind of remove kind of names and universities and things like that to try and make sure that we're not um, being overly biased um, to, towards people coming in. And I think now through kind of getting it wrong um, and getting it right, you start to build up kind of an understanding of um, those people. And I think, you know, you, know, you get people who, depending on the role, it, it sometimes will require certain kind of behavioral traits that, you, that you're looking for. And I think for me, it's been kind of the power of introverts. I think mm. those are the ones that are often kind of overlooked. Um, um, and, you know, how, how, re how reliable and like how brilliant they can be and kind of those. So it's learning just how to motivate different types of people and work there. In terms of like how you get them in, it's a lot of luck. Mm. I have a kind of a thing where I love, you know, I've really loved it bringing in talented postdocs. Mm. Um, I believe that kind of the UK has some amazing um, researchers and then academia is incredibly and increasingly difficult to break into as a professor, as, as you know. Um, and and therefore, you know, taking that some of that talent and, and pulling it through into kind of some of our organizations has been a really good strategy. So many of the team have, have PhDs and postdocs. Um, on my main job now, obviously, is is, is centered around um, raising investment funds and investing in kind of the next generation of entrepreneurs and the next, um, you know, wave of deep technology companies across healthcare and climate. And, um, you know, having that technical training, um, but also having that creativity that you get from research where I suppose one of the things is, is in the real world, there's no MART schemes. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, there is, you, you can just do whatever you want. And a lot of people feel like there's a, like fixed paths here, there or everywhere. But the reality is like, you know, entrepreneurship is like hugely creative. You just be like, I want to do that. So I create a narrative and the story, you know, and all finance is just um, securitization and leverage and storytelling. So like, you know, you can, it's very powerful when you know how to build companies and go after different, different, different ideas. I believe that a lot of the skill sets you get doing PhDs and doing postdocs are really transferable to to kind of um, entrepreneurship, especially within the deep technology kind of sector, because it teaches you to kind of think independently, like drive your own projects, kind of be able to present complex ideas. Um, hopefully, um, I think it's three hundred and fifty jobs now across across the across the kind of two incubators. Um, you know, we've provided a lot of jobs for kind of some really really amazing um, researchers, and that's why it works in Bristol. It's a, it's a body of just incredibly bright, hardworking, motivated individuals. Yeah, we do. And I think it's so important for all of the people you've described and at earlier stage of their career as well, to just have their, their eyes open and their horizons broad in terms of the possibilities. It, it saddens me sometimes to talk to early career researchers, PhD students, research associates who you think that it's kind of academia is the pinnacle and anything else is a compromise. And that's so untrue. There's so many amazing paths you can tread and it's got to be the right one for you. But some of the career pathways that you've provided and, and others besides are enormously rewarding. And what I would love to see and what's a pipe dream of mine is how we take the people you've referred to who've gone and spent some years working in the sorts of organizations and companies you support. And then we bring them back into the academic fold or let them have a foot in each camp and all of the environments benefit from those extraordinary skills to, for our walls to be more porous and more welcoming and respecting of those skills. 100%. I think all great ideas come at the interfa interface between subjects. Um, you know, let's say innovation is where ideas have sex. It's this, <laughs> this, this, this idea that, you know, it's the edges of physics and biology and, it, and it's kind of when people kind of get these kind of viewpoints from different from different kind of vantage points so there's a viewpoint you get when you're in academia and there's a viewpoint you get as an entrepreneur and there's a viewpoint when you build buildings and there's so i think it's where you piece them all together and you see kind of opportunities in the cracks um so it's really really important for people to be multidisciplinary um because i think if you can then go back into academia 
you can maybe drive something that's novel and new and that's what we're trying to do right we're yeah. trying to kind of come up with new ideas and, and true, improve true. society um so yeah it, it's really important that we get kind of um you know there's a porous membrane between between the two so we've talked quite a bit about about xylo and about the incubators do you want to say a little bit more about science creates ventures so what what gave rise to it if it's not obvious and, and yeah. what you hope to achieve what's your vision so th the vision is you know so, so the mission is that we want to improve healthcare quality of life and the environment um and we believe that science and research um is a huge untapped potential in the uk to do more in terms of how it benefits society how we get technology through to the public and we have a three-pronged approach to innovation. And that is you need um, somewhere to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's the incubators. You need, if you want to do research, you know, where do I do my research? Yeah. And then, um, you know, we need people who've done it before, who are doing it. And that's the community. That is kind of the ecosystem. There's 350 people kind of work at these companies, plus partners, plus academics. So there's a kind of collective kind of knowledge on kind of how to you know, create some of these really hard to get skills. And then of course, um, you know, they need to raise money. Mm. And um, venture capital is is a, an important type of investment vehicle. And what we do is we, we, we make lots of very high risk investments um, with the hope that one or two will work. Um, and um, this has been like a really effective tool for, for innovation and how we fund high risk innovation. The way you describe, I want to say your career, but we're talking about a period of less than 10 years here. So, so that's actually really quite a short period to yeah. have done so many different things. But the way you describe it, it sounds quite... It sounds like someone with ADHD. Uh, that wasn't at all what I was going to say, but more, but but arguably yes. But it sounds like you've um, you've seen exciting opportunities that energise you and you've gone for them. The way I so, describe it is like the, the problem that I have, mm. you know, I... I deeply troubled but the, the the problem the problem that i have is that if we if i see something that needs to be fixed i have to fix it so and i so and i, I kind of i then make it my kind of goal when i see that, that what what do you mean there's no space for us to spin companies out and hundreds of millions of pounds of government money goes into research and then we've got nowhere to spin it out to how could that be possible and now i've got to now we've got to set an incubator up to to solve that problem so there's been these and they're not Hang on a minute. You mean that people can't even raise the funding, even if they've got the great technology? Well, let's 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 contribute. So I think it's the, there's been a few of these problems. So I think it's it's been that. And as you keep uncovering them, you, you need kind of more and more people to kind of pick up the crumbs. And so so it's 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 been this kind of collective, um, you know, amazing people that kind of work um, with me and alongside me um, that are really motivated, empowered to kind of you know, go after some, some really big issues. And I think we believe that there are a lot of issues to go after. So it's a lot of things to be busy with. One of the things I'm interested to explore is, is how one defines failure. If you have put everything into something, if you've tried every opportunity and it doesn't work out the way you planned, is that defined as a failure? I mean, an investor might say, you're an investor now. You might say, if I don't get my 10 by, it's a failure. But I think this comes back to the most, like, why are you doing whatever you're doing? Mm. Is it to impress your friends? Is it to impress mm. your parents? Is it to kind of, because it should, you should be doing stuff for yourself. Mm. Okay, so so I think like, you know, as long as you are bought in and you're doing something for you, I think that's the one thing I learned. It's like, you know, it's when I start doing things for me mm. um, and why I wanted to do them, um, that's where things started to go a bit better for me. When I kind of was pushing for others and approval, um, I think that's where things kind of can, can go down the wrong path. So I think like all of this kind of what is failure, I think, you know, the only way you learn is by making mistakes. If you continually get everything um, right, you know, what do you learn? I'd be, I'd be an awful to be that person. I mean, it'd be so boring. Um, so, you know, I've, you know, I've absolutely taken a career where my job is to get it wrong 50% of the time. <laughs> You know, and that that would be an amazing yeah. result. Like if I got it wrong only fifty percent of the time in my venture fund, I'd be considered like a real. You success. would be a genius, a bona fide genius. Yeah. Absolutely. So like my job is to take enough risk yeah. and to make mistakes, and that's the best place in the world. Like if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. If you're not pushing yourself, you're not falling. You're not improving. So you really need to like you know part of the beauty of life is that struggle, is that failure. 
because that's where you improve and that's how you get better. So you kind of have to embrace it and enjoy that process. As excruciating it is, as it is along the way, that's sort of part of what makes life you know, worth living. That's all for this Enterprise session. But join us again soon to hear more about the way our amazing staff and students are translating their enterprising ideas into real-world impact. And do please click on the links if you'd like to contact the University of Bristol.